So the objectives uh, today are listed. Um, we will go through some of the differential diagnoses of immune thromocytopenia. And um, as uh, Dr. Ritchie mentioned, the historical perspectives on pathophysiology, and I think we have insights into uh, uh, some newer uh, molecular mechanisms which we have been able to manipulate. So before I start my talk, I want to show this disclaimer. Do not attempt to do what I'm going to show in the next slide. And, and no story in ITP starts without the mention of the word uh, uh, Harrington. And Harrington, uh, uh, William Harrington Sr., was somebody who moved from St. Louis from Miami where I trained. And the story goes that he, in the 19, uh, uh, late 1940s and 50s, he wanted to sh uh, uh, sh uh, prove the cause of thromocytopenia, saw uh, a lady with thromocytopenia, took the sera and injected it himself. This is something that today's IRB will not approve. He not only did that, he went ahead and treated his kids. Two kids who are now, uh, uh, who are, uh, one of them is still alive. And th that graph that you see is the result of that. So he was admitted to the ICU with uh, plated counts of 70,000. He actually had a seizure. And he went on to prove that this seizure actually contained antibodies. And that's how this whole idea about this autoimmune process of immune thrombocytopenia came about. And I, I was fortunate to train uh, under his uh, protégés, like Dr. Ahn and Eric Lian, and so this is an important story. It will never happen again. Having said that, thrombocytopenia is a very big problem, particularly in the inpatient setting, uh, definitely in the outpatient setting for various reasons. You have to, the caveats in this slide are that the uh, plated counts are probably different, uh, slightly different uh, ranges for different ethnicities. Uh, it, it carries a lot of morbidity and mortality in the inpatient setting. Obviously, uh, when you talk to the fellows and the trainees, uh, the uh, approach to thromocytopenia, it's a very broad category of increased destruction of the platelets, either in the periphery or in the bone marrow, or decreased production or sequestration in the spleen. Uh, you have to, uh, in, in the rare event, rule out the pseudothromocytopenia as a possible uh, uh, technical uh, laboratory error. Once all these things have been ruled out and you find no cause, you are under pressure from the surgeon to come up uh, with the, these uh, counts that are required for procedures. And these are arbitrary numbers. You, you, we can argue about this. But for today's uh, um, practice with the surgeons, I think these are, depending on what kind of surgery that needs to be performed, you have these numbers. And you have to be good with the surgeon because they're the same surgeons that uh, will help you doing the splenectomy in these patients. Uh, the platelets, uh, of course, when they do drop less than uh, 30,000, it can be dangerous with comorbid condition. And you all know that when it drops to less than 10,000, there's this risk of spontaneous bleed in critical areas such as in the brain. So this is the traditional pathophysiology of ITP. And again, at, as I teach my fellows and residents, this pathophysiology can be understood uh, if you're from New York and Brooklyn. You can look at it as... Uh, the uh, bully in the alley. The bully here is the macrophage, and the alley here is the spleen, and the platelets get marked with these antibodies that are produced, and these antibodies for the most part are autoantibodies against certain platelet membrane uh, proteins, uh, 2B3A or whatever the case may be. They get marked, and uh, these antibodies drag them to the FC receptor, and the macrophages uh, beat them up. Uh, so far, uh, that's been a B-cell mediated process. There is also some suggestion of a D-cell orchestration. Uh, the big piece that we are today uh, more aware of is this bone marrow, uh, if you will, impotency in trying to come up or meet with the demands of what's happening in the periphery. So an immune mediated process has been the traditional pathophysiology of ITP, but I will show you in the next slide uh, that the bone marrow impotency, if you will, is one of the other pieces of the puzzle that needs to be kept in mind. And a good comparison uh, uh, for that is the, the thrombopoietin, the major cytokine, which is responsible for uh, increased megakaryopoiesis and, and the pinching of the platelets. Uh, let's go back to the slide. And if you look at the thrombopoietin, thrombopoietin levels in the normal uh, 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 people, it's appropriately normal within the range. 
In aplastic anemia, we have where you have a completely um, uh, empty bone marrow, the, the TPO levels are appropriately high, but in ITP or immune-mediated thrombocytopenia, it is normal or, in, or low, and, and I would say inappropriately normal. So this is the message uh, for the rest of the talk. So the second piece of the puzzle that we have to understand about the pathophysiology of ITP is that the bone marrow does not respond appropriately because of inappropriate TPO levels of the thrombopoietin. The natural history of ITP is known. Spontaneous remissions in the adults is very uncommon. Uh, obviously, you have to deal with all the problems. And um, uh, uh, when the patients do age beyond 60 years, there is a high risk of uh, fatal bleeding. And of course, you're under, uh, under the gun uh, from the surgeons to produce these magic numbers of platelets. So diagnosis of ATP, I won't take uh, too long. It's, an, uh, it's an, a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, blood smear is helpful. You do see occasionally these large platelets, not giant platelets, with normal uh, morphology of the red cells and the white, uh, white cells. Antiplatelet antibodies are not helpful. The bone marrow, I do not normally perform unless there's a reason. The patient is older than 60 years. Or if the therapy that you assume uh, is immune-mediated uh, process does not help. In summary, it is not only an autoimmune process, but it's also an, an incomplete bone marrow response because of functional thrombopoietin deficiency. So that's where we'll focus uh, on the rest of the therapeutic management. I also want to spend a couple of minutes on this new definition based on the Vincenzo conference uh, uh, that was held in 2007 and published in Blood in 2008. Now, the primary, uh, the immune-mediated thrombocytopenia is the new terminology for ITP. It's not idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura anymore. And the primary ITP is uh, no cause associated. The newly diagnosed, not acute ITP, is a new definition for a, a new case uh, seen within the first three months. Then you have persistent ITP and the chronic ITP as you see there, based on the timelines. So the goals of treatment, obviously, are to reach safe plated numbers, and the numbers here that have been, uh, uh, it's a consensus number is 30K. 30K and above is a good number to have, and a complete response with any treatment should be at least 100K. So the treatment recommendations are based on the, this uh, consensus, and of course, based on your surgeon, uh, surgical uh, needs of the patient. So we'll go back to the case history, and as you uh, uh, correctly pointed out, for this 29-year-old, this is a real case scenario, one of my patients, uh, postpartum who developed this petechiae, was on steroids and did, did respond initially, uh, however, did relapse subsequently. So obviously there are many approaches, and I won't hurt anybody's feelings if I choose one over the other, but based on the mechanism of action, you have a choice for the immune-mediated approach. But I want to show you and highlight that this, uh, this bone marrow insufficiency can be helped with the use of uh, the thrombopoietin agonists, such as L-thrombopag or the romiplastin. So these are the guidelines. Uh, steroids are the mainstay of therapy, and you can see this is old data, uh, that steroids can help with increasing the plated counts within the first 7 to 10 days. However, only 13 to 20% of the patients have long term unmaintained remissions. So you need to think of additional possibilities. Could you use high-dose dexamethasone versus prednisolone? There's still a debate. This study that is, uh, that is presented at ASH a couple of months ago suggested that there's no difference. The only caveat is the dexamethasone pulse is just once. There is sufficient data to show that if you give more dexamethasone on a frequent basis, a couple of uh, weeks apart, you can get a very high response. There are, as you know, problems with the use of steroids. And hence, you have to think of other possibilities, such as use of IVIG, use of uh, Rogam, and splenectomy, and perhaps rituxin. Just a few seconds on splenectomy and rituxin. Splenectomy, the long-term outcomes, there are uh, two-thirds of them do have a very good response. Unfortunately, you need to find a, a good surgeon that uh, can reduce the uh, surgical complications. The predictors of response are controversial, and there are some long-term consequences today that we uh, hear about, such as sepsis and thromboembolic events with splenectomy. Rituxin has been used. We don't really know, know the, uh, what the right dose is. It's a, a financial MTD of Genentech, I should say, that came, where we came about with 375 milligram per meter square, but there's also data with 100 milligrams on a weekly basis that this produce some response. Um, dexamethasone has been combined with rituxin, to, uh, uh, to achieve uh, a response in about two-thirds of the patient. But the long-term data that is presented in ASH do not suggest that the rituxin is helpful in sustaining a long-term remission. 
they're disappointingly low. They're less than 25%. And of course, there's potential complications in cost, and I understand that several investigators, such as Dr. Stasi and others, have had patients with PML reactivation. So in this patient, uh, we decided to use uh, Eltromopag, as some of you picked, or four, uh, 25% of you did pick uh, this uh, uh, choice. So we'll talk more about this TPO agonist. And the two TPO agonists that have been approved, one is Romiplastum, it's a peptido body, shown on the left here. It has four peptide, the receptor binding domain, and has an FC carrier domain. And the Eltromopag is a non-peptide small molecule, and both have been approved in the US and Europe and, and also in Australia, as I understand. And if you look at the thrombopoietin, it works uh, by activating the megakaryocytes through uh, the JAK pathways, the same JAK pathways, the flip side of which can cause thrombocytemia and the, uh, the V617 mutation in, in the myeloproliferative diseases. But in this case, without the mutation, the thrombopoietin activation leads to increased platelet production. The romiplastum is a compound that has developed by Amgen. Several studies have been done. It's a peptido body as opposed to an antibody. And there was an antibody development which is disastrous about 10 years ago. And so this is a very smart way of trying to develop a, a, a receptor-mediated um, approach of activating the, uh, the um, thrombopoiesis through the C-mipyl receptor. So the pivotal studies with romiplastum uh, was done in uh, patients with uh, relapsed refractory ITP. Uh, this is an uh, open-label extension, uh, open-label study, which, which had an extension um, aspect to it. Um, uh, it. The dose of end plate was one microgram per kilogram starting dose. And as you see, the initial part was a randomization with a placebo. And the patients were also allowed to go on concurrent ITP therapies, and which were allowed to be de-escalated when the plate counts went up to 100,000. And there was an extension part, which I'll allude to in the long-term management. So the, several of these patients, about 80 to 90 percent of these patients, did achieve responses, whether they're splenectomized, non-splenectomized. And you can look at the uh, events of uh, prevention from bleeding, which are also very impressive. And I'll show you the long-term data in a little while, but this uh, data was based on the first 42 days of uh, treatment with romeplastum. There were some uh, certain adverse events that were seen related to a headache, some upper respiratory tract infections as opposed to uh, the, the patients that have got uh, the placebo, and some arthralgia. It may be a class effect, as you will see, with L-tromopag. L-tromopag, on the other hand, is an oral non-peptide thrombopoietin receptor agonist. Uh, it has an approval, and a, a similar approval in, in Europe, US, and, and in Australia. There are several studies that have been done, and these, study, uh, these studies, uh, the initial studies with the dose finding study, and uh, subsequent studies looked at trying to reduce the load of concurrent ITP medications. There are, is also an extension study. Sorry about that. I, I, uh, sorry, I, I violated the first rule of Dr. Coleman. Uh, this dose finding study led to a dose of 50 milligrams to be used on a daily basis. And subsequent 773B study design was a placebo-controlled uh, study with the standard of care uh, with l with the ability to scale down the uh, concurrent ITP medications. So responses, 60, 60 to 70 percent of the patients did achieve the goal of uh, 50,000 platelets at least within the first 42 days. And response of L-tromopag was seen regardless of the baseline platelet level, splenectomy status, or response to previous treatment. So very impressive data. Obviously, you can already see that there's differences between the use. The romiplastin I didn't mention is subcutaneous administration, and this is an oral agent. So this patient, um, as, uh, the plated counts went up to 200K for the first two months in L-tromopag, and how do you manage? And this is a real a life scenario, and we, I didn't ask this question, and you can see from the data uh, from the extension studies, uh, and I'll, I'll give you the answers soon after that. So what's the long-term data beyond the 42 days, which is set, uh, set as a goal for both romoplastum and L-tromopag? Romoplastum extension studies included all the patients that went on the initial studies. So they could start with this one microgram per kilogram subcutaneous uh, injections on a weekly basis, uh, uh, and, and there's indi individualized dose adjustments up to a maximum dose of 10 micrograms per kilogram. And you can see that the plated counts are maintained for several weeks, 
Dr. Bussell submitted, uh, uh, presented um, uh, the data at ASH, and this is a six-year follow-up, a very uh, sturdy response, and about 90% of them still are able to maintain the plated counts. More importantly, the medications, the concurrent medications over time were reduced to about 20%, and the number of rescue medications that are used also very less. So in summary, romeplastin, you could see that the 91% of the patients had plated counts, about 50,000, which I think is the, uh, the real goal uh, today for uh, chronic ITP patients, or maybe even some persistent ITP patients. Uh, th these are some of the uh, side effects that were seen that I'll allude to eventually. The l long-term data was very similar, extension studies, um, but the only uh, caveat uh, here was that the l dosing was intermittent. Patients were given l uh, and they were also given uh, six weeks of uh, break in between. And now this data was presented by Dr. Mansoor Saleh at ASH uh, uh, last year. Uh, I think it is a four-year follow-up. And the data, again, similarly, the plated counts were maintained for as long as that uh, time period. And the incidence of bleeding over time was reduced to nothing in these patients. So long-term treatment of ITP with l 86% of the patients still had this, uh, maintained uh, this goal. Uh, there were some uh, side effects that were seen with uh, reversible uh, uh, liver, abnorm liver abnormalities, mostly at, um, uh, hyperbilirubinemia, which was reversed on stopping the medication. So what did we do to this patient? Uh, this patient, we didn't follow the extent study. We started to taper this uh, dose. And one of the caveats with both romeplastin and l is that you should not stop this right away because it appears that once patients achieve, uh, go into the state of chronic ITP, they have a tendency to relapse. And it's generally the case, in, as maybe the, with your experience with use of IVIG or any other agent, in this situation, they have this phenomenon called rebound thrombocytopenia, where the plated counts actually go lower than what they started out with. So you have to slowly bring the counts down. So right now, this patient is now on at, uh, three times a week l at 50 milligrams uh, daily. The, uh, another point about dosing uh, is important. It's individualized dosing. Where, with romeplastin, it's one microgram per kilogram all the way up to 10 microgram per kilogram. Uh, l pack on the other hand, has some uh, ethnic uh, pharmacogenomic differences. The Asians, the clearance levels are, uh, are probably half. So the starting dose for Asians, uh, East Asians in particular, should be 25 milligrams um, uh, daily for the first uh, uh, 42 days and then subsequently follow the extend, extension study um, um, f f format. So th this is, uh, the, um, these are the known and possible adverse consequences. We already talked about the possibility of rebound thrombocytopenia. Initial arthralgia and headaches were seen in both the studies. Perhaps it's a cytokine burst phenomenon that is seen. Thrombocytosis uh, is a problem, and you should not tend to overtreat these patients, so you should always monitor the counts. On this study, you would do it on a, uh, initially on a weekly basis and then go uh, on to every other week. Uh, and, you, and the goal is to not get the plated counts about 200,000. Thrombosis has been seen in both the studies. The problem with thrombosis is that these were venous events. And uh, as we understand that the thrombocytopenia, ITP, does not come alone. It also comes along with uh, several other possibilities of uh, thrombotic uh, predisposition, such as antiphospholipid syndrome, factor V laden, etc. And in the romoplastum studies, because there was concern of leukemia in MDS patient studies, it was not seen in ITP, it was not seen in l -tromopag. And that too was, it was an increase in circulating blasts. So perhaps there is a stimulatory effect with the use of uh, thrombopoietic uh, uh, agonists, uh, and long-term data is required. So I'll eventually get to, to the point because I think I'm running out of time. So my use of TPO mimetics, and I made a case to you that the immune-mediated process is not the only uh, uh, piece of uh, puzzle in ITP. I think the, the lack of su sufficient bone marrow support is also important. Uh, so we have two great options to use with the thrombopoietin and uh, mimetics. Uh, and I use it in patients who are refractory to other treatments, short-term intervention for procedures. Uh, it allows me to, uh, to contemplate uh, other treatment options, whether it's splenectomy or uh, other treatments. And I think the way of the future is to combine them with other therapies. So uh, stay tuned for that. And this is just a summary of the initial treatment with immune-mediated approaches. Uh, 
And, and for you to keep in mind is that not only the uh, immune-mediated uh, strategies are important, but the thrombopoietin uh, uh, agonist, receptor agonist, also an important stay of treatment for patients with ITP. I think I'll stop here. Be more than happy to answer any questions at this session. Thanks.